Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Marta Halpert. I'm a journalist and writer, and I work now for the Munich-based weekly magazine called Focus and for various other media in Austria and uh, internationally. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to uh, host or to chair this exceptional event where we are going to hear the testimonials of three outstanding personalities. They are outstanding and admirable, not only because of their personal courage and their stamina and the resolve to fight for a worthy cause, but also for managing their daily lives, earning a living despite this additional huge task. And it cannot be easy to talk about these consuming experiences, neither for the first time, nor as they do it, to repeat it over and over again, and especially to a big audience and in public. So we appreciate this very much, what, what you are doing. And it's, uh, of course, intention that on the day of women, we are three to one. But we'll give the gentleman enough space to, <laughs> to present his uh, position. So I would like to start introducing our first speaker, uh, which is Marina Nemat, who is an Iranian author and former prisoner of conscience. Following the Islamic Revolution in 79, 1979, Marina, a young civic activist, was arrested in January 1982 at the age of 16. She criticized Ayatollah Khomeini political indoctrination in a banned, actually illegal, pupils magazine. She spent more than two years in Evin, a political prison in Tehran, where she was tortured and came very close to execution. A prison guard saved her, demanding a very high price. The guard guaranteed her safety and that of her friends and family if Marina, who was born into a Russian Orthodox Christian family, converted to Islam and married him. Nema did so to save herself and her family and has been courageously outspoken about her experiences in the forced marriage, including the subsequent sexual abuse she suffered. After her husband, this guard, died, she remarried in Tehran and fled to Canada with her new husband in 1991. Her memoir of her life in Iran, called Prisoner of Tehran, first published in Canada in 2007, has since been published in 28 other countries and has become an international bestseller. In 2007, Marina received the inaugural Human Dignity Award from the European Parliament, and in 2008, she received the prestigious Grinzane Prize in Italy. Only three years ago, she published her second book called After Tehran, A Life Reclaimed, and there Marina, since then, Marina has regularly spoken in schools, at universities, and conferences around the world, and sits on the board of directors of the Canadian Center for Victims of Torture and on advisory boards at the Action by Christians for the Abolition of Torture and the Pen Club of Canada. She also teaches memoir writing in Farsi and English at the School of Continuing Studies at the University of Toronto. She writes a lot of book reviews in the Globe and the Mail. We are very happy to have you here. Please. Thank you. Yeah, I think she, said she stays wherever you want. Wherever you okay, want. if uh, you don't mind, I will stand. I, uh, I'm very short, so this way I'm drowning. <laughs> and I can see you better. Thank you so, so much for having me here today. It is a pleasure, it is an honor, and uh, I have to thank Hillel because, uh, you know, he, he has always included me. And um, I, I think one of the issues that I faced more than anything when I was in prison was that I felt that the world had forgotten us, 
that the world didn't give a damn what happened to us, and that the world didn't care. And to be honest with you, I think what we thought was actual reality. So thank you, Hillel. Thank you for including me. Thank you for putting, putting attention on this very important issue. So I'm going to jump right in. I have a lot of ground to cover. I was born in Tehran, Iran, in uh, 1965. And back then, as you know, Iran was not an Islamic republic. We had a king. We called him the Shah. And when I was growing up, I was a Christian. I grew up in downtown Tehran. My father was a ballroom dancing instructor. My mother was a hairdresser. So I literally grew up between the sounds of the cha-cha and the tango and women with really big, poofy hair. And when I looked out of my window, I saw a four-lane street with a lot of cars, a lot of beautiful shops, and people going about doing their business. Back then, Iran was governed by secular laws. So according to the laws of Iran, not that it was always practiced, but according to the laws of Iran, a woman could become a judge. A woman could even become, according to the law, could become the prime minister. Schools were free. Elementary school, high school, university was free. And I wanted to become a medical doctor. And the road was clear. I began studying English when I was in kindergarten. My first language is Russian. My second language is Farsi. My third language is English. And I had already started my ABCs in kindergarten. We had a cottage by the Caspian Sea. I spent my summer there wearing bikinis on the beach, boys and girls together. And we would be dancing and singing until the wee hours of the morning. I had a green bikini with white polka dots. And <laughs> then we got back home from the cottage in 1978. I was 13 years old, I was very naive and innocent, and my family were not political at all, and there was a tank parked at my door, and I had no idea what was going on. I had never, ever seen a tank before. So I asked my mother, what's that? And she said, it's a tank. I asked, oh, are they making a movie? And she said, no, it's real. And it was real. There were soldiers with guns everywhere. Well, long story short, I'm not going to get here into a lesson on the Iranian Revolution. The revolution, as we know, succeeded. Ayatollah Khomeini had become the leader of this revolution. The left and the right and the center, they had all come together, and they were supporting the Ayatollah and an Islamic Republic. The problem was that, and I tried because I was curious. I didn't know what an Islamic Republic was. It was 1978. 79. So I asked the people on the street. They were my friends, my neighbors, they were yelling and screaming for it. And I asked them, what is an Islamic Republic? And nobody knew what it was. They said the Ayatollah has promised us freedom and democracy. He's a man of God. He couldn't possibly be lying. Well, he was. But the people of Iran believed him. There has never been a revolution in the history of mankind where people get on the street and they say, we want a horrible dictatorship. It doesn't work that way. People want freedom and democracy. And that is exactly what the people of Iran wanted. And yes, Iran was a dictatorship. We had a lot of personal freedoms, yes. But we had no political freedoms. So yes, the revolution succeeded. The schools had been shut down. They reopened. We went back to school. And for about a year or so, maybe even less, things were great because all the old laws were out the window. The new laws were still being written. So basically, there was no law in the country. But in the meantime, those new laws that were based on Sharia law were being written. Now, in the meantime, life went on, and we were doing our thing, and we, we were talking about social justice and about making Iran a better place. We were a bunch of teenagers that had very big hopes for the future of their country. And then things began to change as early as 1980. Now, I'm going to give a footnote here, a little one. Horror in history doesn't happen overnight. It is not that we go to bed tonight, and tomorrow we have Hitler, Stalin, Mao, or Khomeini, for that matter, on our hands. It happens little by little. We lose our liberties little by little. There are always danger signs around us. We begin to lose freedoms, little things at the beginning. And those danger signs, because they happen all over the place and they seem disconnected, the adults in the world are usually too busy paying their mortgage, making their car payments. They don't pay attention. They forget to connect the dots. And by the time we realize what has happened, it's too late. Because now, if you speak up, somebody is going to point a gun to your head and is going to, to pull the trigger. And by the way, let's not forget that Hitler did not happen in the Middle East. Hitler happened in Germany, a country that had 
some sort of a democratic process in place. So if those of us, including me, who now live in democracies, I live in Canada, if we think that democracy by itself is going to protect us against the likes of Hitler, please do think again. Democracy needs maintenance. Democracy is as good as every individual who lives in a democratic country. We don't maintain it. We don't take responsibility for it. And we just look up to, to our politics politicians and expect them to do the right thing in every single occasion, we are going to lose our freedoms. So as the citizens of a democracy, we are responsible for the way it behaves. It is not just up to the politicians. We have a voice we have to use. In Iran, we began to lose our personal freedoms. Not only we didn't gain any political freedoms, but we, got, we began to lose our personal ones. Dancing became illegal, singing became illegal, holding your boyfriend's hand in public became illegal. One day I looked around me, having fun had become illegal. What do you think we did? We protested. Not that necessarily we were political. I mean, how political can 15-year-olds get? But we were just sick and tired of it. Sick and tired of being told how to dress, how to behave. And we protested. Of course, the world didn't know about it because, yeah, there was no internet. Yes, all the, all the foreign journalists had been expelled from Iran. But the world did hear about the American hostages. But the world didn't really hear about our protests. Well, People started disappearing as early as young people, as early as 1981 in the spring. I was arrested on January 15, 1982. I was 16. I was in the bathroom. I was at home. I was about to take a bath. The doorbell rang. My mother called my name. I opened the bathroom door, and there were two guns pointed in my face. I was 16. People have asked me, were you scared? No, I was not scared. Why? Because I'm brave? No, I'm not brave at all. Actually, I'm afraid of cockroaches. I'm petrified of cockroaches. So I'm not brave at all. I was just an average, normal, innocent, simple 16-year-old. I entered a state of shock. When you have grown up dancing on the beach in bikinis and then there are two guns pointed in your face, what happens is that you enter a state of shock. It's like body armor. It goes on and it clicks automatically. It is a gift from God, but it doesn't protect you against bullets. It protects you against emotion. So I didn't feel anything. My mom and dad were crying. I was looking at them and I was thinking, why are you crying? No big, no big deal. I'm just getting arrested. They drove me north to Evin prison. By the way, Evin is still completely operational. It still has hundreds, if not thousands, of prisoners. So what I'm telling you is not history. What I'm telling you is present tense. Actually, I have with me the story of one of these political prisoners. I have a habit of campaigning for one political prisoner at a time. So please do come up to me, and I will give you that uh, piece of paper, and it will tell you what you can do to help. So please do come to me. I was taken into a prison, blindfolded upon arrival, take, taken along hallway after hallway after hallway, told to sit down. I was taken for interrogation. They questioned me about my activities, about having been on protest rallies, about writing articles against the government. Yes, I had done all of that. Yes. And I told them the truth because it wasn't some state secret. Everybody knew I attended protest rallies. My friends knew, the principal knew, my parents knew, the neighbors knew, everybody knew. What was the point of hiding? So then they took me to another room and they took off my blindfold. I was in a small room with two men, Ali and Hamid, and they handcuffed me. When they handcuffed me, they saw that my hands were going to slide out of the cuffs because I was 90 pounds back then. So they put both of my wrists together and they put the two wrists into one cuff and as it clicked, my right wrist cracked and the torture had not even begun. Then they tied me to the bare wooden bed. I was lying down on my stomach, and they lashed the soles of my feet with a length of cable. The most favorite method of torture in the Middle East. Why? Because it's effective. Your nerve ends are in your feet. With every strike of the lash, your nervous system explodes, then it's magically put back together again, and you're wide awake for the next. I forgot how to think, I forgot how to count, I forgot how to breathe, and I forgot how to pray. And I'm a Catholic, so that's, that's a big order to forget how to say Hail Mary. But even I even forgot how to do that. And they beat me and beat me. Eventually they stopped and I looked at my feet and I laughed out loud because my feet looked like overgrown party balloons with toes on them, color indigo blue. 
I couldn't understand how the human body can swell like that. Then they make you walk, then they beat you again, they make you walk, they beat you again. Why? But well, first of all, let me ask you if you know what torture is for. Torture is practiced in more than 80 countries in the world. Why do they do it? Is it to get information? Really? I would have confessed I was Jesus Christ under torture. I would have confessed I was a CIA spy. If the devil appeared, I would have sold him my soul with whipped cream on top to just go back home and sleep in my own bed. Torture is not to get information. Is torture to kill few people? Definitely not, because there are much more economical, efficient ways to kill people. They want to kill you, they will put you in front of a firing spot. Why would they do the hard work of torturing you? No reason. So what is torture for? Torture is designed to kill the human soul. When they succeed, they stop. If they do not succeed, then they will execute you. I was given a death sentence. It was reduced to life in prison. It's very easy to get a death sentence in Evin, especially back then. I was sent to the cell block with hundreds, maybe thousands of other girls, 90% under the age of 20. It was high school in hell. Every night, we had mass executions. Every night, we listened as our friends and cellmates would be, would be shot just outside the prison, just out behind the courtyard, every single night. There was one bathroom for about 300 people. So basically, we, we spent our days standing in line to go to the bathroom. And as we are standing, names are being announced over the loudspeaker, so and so and so, so and so, come to the office. The girls who are called would be taken for interrogation, torture, and maybe ex even execution. If your name is called, go and go quietly. Because if you make a sound or if you fuss, they will come and shoot you right here. So go. Now, the rest of us, we stand there. What do we do all day, standing in the bathroom line? We talk. About what? Well, not about social justice. That didn't end well. We talked about everything that made us human. Because we knew that the world didn't care about what happened to us. We knew that outside the prison walls, nobody was talking about it. We knew that the UN was not talking about it. We knew that international newspapers were not writing about it, because news does come into the prison. We were hearing all of that. So we had to keep each other alive. So we talked about family reunions, birthday parties, New Year celebrations. We had to keep hope alive. And that's exactly what we did. Many of the girls who were with me in Evin prison, many of them are buried in mass graves. But I'm here. I'm still standing. The girl I was before Evin is dead. And the person I have become is a witness. No more, no less. Yes, I am a wife and a mother and a writer, and I appreciate all of the above. But beyond any of those, I am a witness. There are no memorial walls in Iran. There aren't any beautiful marble walls in which the name of the victims of this system that is still going strong would be carved. So until then, I have to become that marble wall. Until then, until the day, which will come when the names of my friends would be carved in stone. But till then, this fight is mine. There was another form of torture in Evin. Sometimes girls were called at midnight, were returned to the cell block at 5 AM, no visible torture sign. If you knew the girl, you would ask her, where were you? She would give you some lame excuse, like they took me for interrogation, nothing happened. Yeah, right. They called me for interrogation five months after my arrest. My interrogator was there, and he told me very clearly, you are going to convert to Islam, you are going to become my wife, or I will arrest your parents. I knew he wasn't kidding. I said, fine, I'll do it. I'll do anything. Just don't touch my parents. This man forced me to marry him at the age of 17. I was being raped over and over again under the name of marriage in solitary confinement in Evin prison, and it was absolutely fine. I couldn't protest. I couldn't go to the authorities because it was legal. I'm not going to get into much more detail about that because I have written extensively about it, so you can read my books. But the important point to mention here is that, yes, Mr. Rouhani came into power a few weeks ago in Iran. 
And around the time when he became the president, about 80 political prisoners were freed. And one of them was Hamid Ghassami Shal, for whom I had campaigned for three years. That is great. We rejoice that these prisoner, prisoners were freed. But since Mr. Rouhani came into power till now, more than 80 prisoners have been executed. For, so, for every prisoner that they release, they have killed one. And not only that, they are denying medical treatment to the prisoners. This is a silent way of executing political prisoners. They don't even need to shoot anybody. The person gets pneumonia, you just don't give them medication. The person needs insulin, you don't give it to them. You just get a simple skin irritation, you know, maybe some sort of an infection on your skin, they don't give you antibiotics, you die. It is as simple as that. The Minister of Justice in Iran right now, the man who's today the Minister of Justice in Iran, he gave the order of the execution of many of my friends. He signed our execution orders in the 80s. And this man is today the Minister of Justice in Iran. Mr. Rouhani himself, he has been a part of the system since, since day one. Has he apologized to the world? Has he apologized to the people of Iran? Has he acknowledged the fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of political prisoners were tortured? Has he acknowledged that thousands of underage young people were executed in the 80s and later in Iran? No, he has not. And yet, he has put on a beautiful smiley uh, face for the world, and he's telling the, the world that he's a reformist. Excuse me? Reformist? So Iran has not changed. Please don't allow it to fool you. The same band of thugs and mass murderers that put me in prison and tortured me and raped me, the same band of thugs is still in power. These are the same people. They have just put on a smiley face to look happy and democratic to the rest of the world. So please be careful. I'm not asking for Iran to be bombed. No, not at all. Not at all. But please let's know reality and let's deal with it the way it is because wishful thinking is not going to take us far. And please let's not forget that silence actually kills. Silence is a weapon of mass destruction. Thank you so, so much. Thank you a lot. I think we are all in shock. And what we can say is that you are everything but not a, a marble wall. You are, you are very, very human and emotional. And uh, despite uh, of these emotions, your will is very strong. And it's great that you are fighting for the others.